or another. Right? It pulls on our attention. It pulls on our uh, uh, affection. It pulls on our desire. It does everything it can to draw our attention. I want to know more about my Jesus. <laughs> I want to know more about my Lord. I want to know more about that homeland. Everything you have here, everything this world has to offer is going to pass away one day. And it won't even exist. Hopefully not even a memory of this life will exist. <laughs> but I want to know where my soul is going. I want to know about heaven. I want to know about my Lord. We're going to be spending eternity there. Listen, God help us catch a glimpse of glory. This world paints a pretty picture for us in every, uh, in every direction we can look. This world's painting a pretty picture, trying to get us to build our hope, our dreams, our plans for the future. How I many has got plans for next week for something that you know you've already planned something on the calendar? We got a whole month full of calendar right here starting today, September 1st. Not very much room left to fit nothing in. Sister Wendy's got just about every blank on our field. We got plans, don't we? This world sets things up and we are planning for next week and the week after that and the month after that and for years we plan for our children's college. Ella's already got money in her college fund. She's four years old. I hope she never sees college. I hope we can plant something in her to teach her about heaven, where she's headed. But this world will gear us to its building our hopes and plans here. It's conveniences that it has to offer us. You know, Satan has planned and he has orchestrated every substitution he can think of for God in your life. He's, he's devised every plan, every convenience he can think of to get your mind off of glory. But I say, catch a glimpse of glory. Catch a glimpse of glory in your life. I was thinking... I saw the other day a commercial on TV about a vending machine. How many knows what vending machines are? Everybody. Well, let me tell you something. I'm, I come from a time when I was a little, little chap. The only thing you could get out of a vending machine, I remember the cigarette machines, but I remember the chewing gum and the crackers and the cookies. You walk up, you put a quarter in. I remember dimes. You could put a dime in and pull a little lever and pack a... A vending machine. Well, it's gone from that to you can go up to a machine now and get money out of it. <laughs> or movies. Well, let me tell you what else they've got. They've got a vending machine now for an automobile. Do you know it? Blew my mind. I'm, I, of course, I'm way, I stay behind times anyway. But yeah, this world's got every convenience you need. You can go online and buy your car. They'll bring it and stack it in a vending machine. You can go down there and push a button. It'll come right out and roll out. The keys is in it. The paperwork's in it. And you can get in it and drive away. What are you saying? You better catch a glimpse of glory. Because this world ain't trying to show it to you. It's trying to show you everything but there is a God and a heaven to gain. God help us. I want to know more about my Lord. Somebody tell me more about Jesus. Somebody tell me more about heaven, where my soul is going to. We need to catch a glimpse of glory. I've heard people say, if I had one wish in this life, it would be to be suspended over hell for one minute. You ever heard somebody say that? Their point is that I could see the, the flame and, and, and the agony and the suffering and feel the heat of hell in hopes that that would steer me to heaven. Well, that's an okay way of thinking if you want to think that way. I've heard people talk about heaven and so much about heaven we don't understand and they've made the statement, I, well, I don't know all about that. 
but I know as long as I miss hell. Well, that's an okay way of thinking if you want to think that way. But I want, to t- I want to share something with us. We need more insight about heaven than just the fear of hell. Hell is hot, but heaven is sweet. You know, uh, yeah, it's good to be afraid of hell and want to avoid that place, but I'm afraid that may not be enough to drive us to heaven. But let me tell you something. If you could catch a glimpse of glory, (laughs) if you could catch the Spirit of God, if we could see God in His splendor and the splendor of heaven, I believe that would be enough to draw us, don't you? God help us to catch a glimpse of glory. Listen, I want to know more about my Lord. I want to know more about my Jesus. I want to know more about that homeland. It's a beautiful song and an encouraging song, but we need to apply it. We need to seek God. Listen, I want to talk to us for just a minute this morning about Moses. Moses had a unique relationship with God. Moses was chosen by God to be the leader of of the nation of Israel to bring his people out of bondage. He had a unique relationship with God. He experienced a lot of things with God no man has ever experienced. He was the man of the hour, the hand chosen by God. He witnessed God in the burning bush, right? The Lord spoke to him out of the burning bush and Moses He pondered on that bush and watched it and it was not consumed by the fire. It was not devoured by the fire. But it was the very presence of God. God spoke to Moses out of the burning bush. What did he say? Take your shoes off. You're standing on holy ground. Well, we know a lot about God this morning, don't we? We ever been close enough that the Lord spoke to you and said, hey, Take your shoes off. You're on holy ground. Moses experienced that. He was, he would, what did that mean? God is in this presence right here. God himself is right here in your presence. The very ground you're standing on is holy ground. He said, Moses, take your shoes off. He had a unique relationship with God. He witnessed all the plagues that the Lord brought on Egypt. He witnessed the miracles brought about by the hand of God, the parting of the Red Sea, everything. There was a pillar of cloud that followed them by the day, a pillar of fire by night that followed them. He witnessed all of this, the manna from heaven, the rock that gave them water. Moses witnessed all of this. He witnessed God's presence as it sat down on Mount Sinai in the cloud and in the devouring fire that sat down there. God's presence come down on Mount Sinai and it just sat down right there. I believe it was for six days. Israel just gazed upon the mountain that represented the presence of God. Well, not only that, but God called Moses up into the mountain. (coughs) Up into the very presence of God. He was there 40 days and 40 nights. You think you know God today? You think you know all you need to know about God? Moses knew him pretty good, didn't he? Look with me in Exodus 33, verse 18. Everything that Moses knew about God, Moses found a desire in his heart to know more. Exodus 33 and 18, Moses said, And he said, I beseech thee, read this with me, Show me thy glory. Let's say it again. Show me thy glory. Oh, what was he saying? Everything that he had witnessed about God, Moses was saying, there's more to know. There's more to see. There's more to witness. He wanted to know everything he could possibly know about God. He said, show me 
thy glory. I'm talking about a desire that I don't believe none of us has found yet. A desire to know more. I'm talking about a depth in God that I don't believe none of us has experienced yet. I know I haven't, but I want to know more. I want that same desire that Moses had. We need a persistent desire, amen, to know more about the Lord. A persistence. I said a persistence to know more. Oh, just to say, I like, yeah, I'd like to know more about the Lord. That ain't going to get you nowhere. But do you remember the parable that Jesus spoke about the unjust judge? There was a little widow woman who came to him. She wanted to be uh, avenged for her adversary. Now, the Bible says this unjust, the judge, well, that says it all right there, don't it? was nothing good about him. He was, he was unjust. He wasn't even fair in his dealings. But the widow woman persisted, come to him. She wanted to be avenged of her adversary. Listen, he, the Bible says he feared not God or man, this judge. But because the widow woman troubled him. And he said, you know, uh, for a while he put her off, but she persistently stayed at him. And he said, I will, I will do this to keep her from worrying me. Uh, even him, even this unjust judge, he found something in his heart somewhere that he was willing to do this for her just so she would leave him alone. Jesus said, How shall not God avenge his own elect which cry day and night? Or how shall not God hear his own elect or avenge them? You want something from God? We want to know more about God? All we've got to do is be persistent in asking and seeking God. The Bible says, Seek and you shall find. Ask, it shall be given thee. Knock, and it shall be opened unto thee. Moses, he was persistent with the Lord. He had this persistence in his heart. He had a unique relationship with God. And he asked the Lord, show me thy glory. The Lord responded, unto Moses, and he said, I will do this thing. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? I will do this thing that you've spoken about. Oh, how willing God is. You know, God would not keep any good thing from you. Oh, he wants us to be drawn in to his presence. He wants fellowship with us. Moses said, show me thy glory. God said, I will do this thing that you've spoken about. Look with me down to verse 21. He says, And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me. Now listen, we're not going to learn much from God when we ain't never even close to him. God said, I'll do this thing, Moses, that you've spoken about. Moses says, show me thy glory. I want to know more about my Lord. God said, I'll do this thing. He said, but there's a place by me. <laughs> there is a place right here near me. Moses, that's where you're going to learn about it. That's where you're going to see it. Some people want to have a far distant relationship with God and know all there is and have all the benefits of his blessings and mercy and grace on their life, and they want to live way out yonder somewhere so far away from God. Right. When trouble comes in their lives, when trials come, they want to say, Jesus, and him be right there. God said, I'll do this thing, but there's a place right here by me. Huh? That's where we're <laughs> going to find out all that there is to know about God. Right by his side. Listen. 
there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. What was the Lord talking about here? We're going to have to get close to God. There is a closeness to God that, that we have not even stepped into yet, that we have not even begun to find. Moses found it. He said, God's, God responded, I'll do this thing, Moses. I'll do this thing you spoke about. But there's a place right here by me, and you're going to have to stand on the rock. What does the rock represent in the Word of God? Anybody know? It represents Christ. Listen, there was a pillar of cloud that followed Israel by day and a pillar of fire by night. And there was also a rock that followed them. And they drank, the Bible says, spiritual waters. It was a spiritual drink that they drank from that spiritual rock. And the Bible says, and that rock followed them. Right? And that rock was Christ. Let me tell you something. There's something significant there that I hope we're going to get to by the end of this message. Christ was where it was destined for us to stand on for our relationship with God. Now, God told Moses, I'll do this for you. There's a place right here by me you're going to have to come to. That rock. You're going to have to stand on that rock. That rock is Christ. Hmm? Amen. And it says, And it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, and I will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. There's a place of safety in the cleft of the rock. There's a place that no power on this earth can touch us. There's a place that we won't be affected by no power that exists when we're in the cleft of the rock, a place that God Almighty has purposed and designed for us to be, a place right here by my side is what he said to Moses. I'm going to put you right here in the cleft of the rock. It was a hiding place. You ever feel like in your heart and spirit you'd like to be hid away from this world? Oh, I do, most often. And it seems like even more and more as the days go by. Sometimes I just, I feel, I feel a a spirit pressing on me. I want to be hid away from this world. Well, we can be spiritually. We can find the cleft in the rock. We can find the place right there by God's side. He said, I will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts. But my face shall not be seen. God was doing a great thing for Moses. No man ever existed, had ever experienced this. He said, Moses, I'll do this thing for you that you've spoken about but I'm going to put you in a place that you can receive this. Let me tell you something. We're not going to receive it somewhere off at at a far distance from the Lord, but we're going to have to be right by his side in order for us to catch a glimpse of his glory. I'm talking about Moses was looking for a deeper assurance and security than he had ever had before. You would think, God speaking to him through the burning bush, was that not enough? It wasn't enough for Moses. He said, I'll show me thy glory. Oh, I want to see all there is. The Lord said, I'll do this thing for you. God, God don't want to hide himself from you. He don't want to keep himself from you. He, he, he don't want to keep any good gift from, that he has from you, but he wants to put you in a place by him that you can experience it. I want to go there, don't you? Listen, we can never afford to think that all we know about God is all we need to know. I'm going to say that again. I want you to think about it. 
You can never afford to think that all you know about God is all you need to know. No. Listen, there's always somewhere that we need to move up with God. Every one of us, from the general overseer to, to, the, to, to the lowest little doorkeeper in the house of, of God, where I don't care who you are, there is somewhere for us to move up to in God. In John 14 and 8, I want us to hear the words of Philip. We've heard this many, many times. I want us to take just a little different look this morning. Philip said, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. He had walked with Christ. Jesus himself spoke to Philip and said, if you, if you know me, if you've seen me, you, you've seen the Father. Philip said, show us the Father. <laughs> now listen, Philip has caught a lot of flack ever since he made that statement. He's caught a lot of flack. Even Jesus responded to him and said, Philip, how can you, as long as I've been with you, how can you say, show us the Father? Philip, he responded personally to him. Well, you know, sometimes we can be in this way 50 years, 60, 70, 80 years. Have, do we know all we need to know? Have we seen all we need to see? Now, no doubt, Philip was lacking something because of Christ's response to him. But I want us to look at something. At least his heart was in the right place. At least he was saying, show us the Father. Maybe he had not seen everything he needed to see. Maybe he had the Christ walk and, and witness right before Philip. Maybe he missed so much. I mean, he's guilty of that. <laughs> but at least he said, show us the Father. He had a desire to see the Father. Maybe all that he had seen was like Moses. It just wasn't quite enough yet to get him established the way he wanted to be established. All I know is he made the statement, show us the Father. I believe his heart's desire was all that he had experienced, he wanted to see more. You know, that's my, that's my desire this morning. I want to see more. I want to know more. I'm afraid that, that, that the devil may deceive some of us based on what we know at this very moment. Oh, yeah. I'm afraid of that. We better have a desire somewhere down deep in our heart that says, Show me the Father. We better somehow, some way in our spiritual walk with Lord, the Lord catch a glimpse of his glory. Listen, Philip says, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. Now, I want us to understand what Philip's saying here. If you go back and take this word sufficeth us, and go to the original Greek word and look up the definitions there, what was Philip saying? He wasn't just saying he wanted to be appeased. He wasn't just saying, you know, do this and I'll hush, and I'll be, you know. No, he's saying, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. Now I want you to listen to the definition of this word. Sufficeth. It means... Nothing else will do. He had a desire. Show us the Father. And it sufficeth us. What was he saying? Won't nothing else do. I've got to see the Father. I want to see the glory of God in my life for myself. Right? He said, it sufficeth us. In other words, it will be enough. To see the glory of God, Philip was saying, then that will be enough. Or it will be sufficient. Sometimes we want to go on sufficiency in things that's not sufficient. Sometimes we think we may 
we may be deceived in our sufficiency, that our relationship with God really isn't yet sufficient. Hmm? But I want you to listen to this, this definition right here that I found with this word. When Philip said, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. This word sufficeth, sufficeth meaning an unfailing strength. An unfailing strength. Let me tell you something. You can be afraid of hell all day long. And it's good that we are. There needs to be more of the fear of hell. But let me tell you something. There's no strength in that. There's only fear. There's, there's no strength in being afraid of anything. But Peter said, well, Philip said, show us the Father. It sufficeth us. In other words, it will give me an unfailing strength to carry on. We need to catch a glimpse of glory that we could find an unfailing strength in our life to carry us on. Many doubt God because they've never seen Him. And many say they don't believe in Him because they've never heard Him speak. I hear this conversation quite often. People will say, if God still worked the way he did in olden times, if he still spoke to men audibly, if he still showed himself, revealed himself, well, that's a cop-out. That right there from the very get-go tells me you don't know enough about God to even start beginning to talk about God. Why? Because that's not the way God operates anymore. If you hold on to that, you will die and leave this life believing God has let you down because he has not audibly spoke to you or revealed himself to you in a burning bush. God does not operate like that anymore. Why? He's God. He can do what he wants to do. But I tell you this, He's given us a spirit. And if you have a desire to catch a glimpse of his glory, you can catch it. You can see it. You can feel it. You can experience it. It'll come alive in your heart. It'll energize your life. It may not be the way you want it to be. God works in his ways. He don't work to appease you and I. But listen. If we catch a glimpse of his glory, it will be in the spirit and that only. Turn with me in Revelations chapter 1. We want to read verses 9 through 18. John the Revelator, he was put on the Isle of Patmos. He was banished from society. He had been boiled. I believe he was had had his eyes put out, I believe. But let me tell you something. He experienced God. Right? Let's listen. Verses, chapter 1, verses 9 through 18. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Oh, this great, now listen, this great vision that John received. How did he receive it? He was already worshiping God. <laughs> he, he was already in the Spirit before this vision came unto him before the Lord dealt with him and, and gave him the, the vision of the book of Revelations, John said, I was in the Spirit. You know what some people try to bypass? The Spirit. Or they try to work out everything under the sun except operating in the Spirit. John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, 
and what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. How did John experience this awesome glimpse of the glory of God, the very throne of God and the Son of God sitting on the throne in the Spirit? He experienced it in the Spirit. He was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. He was where he was supposed to be, doing what he was supposed to be doing, and the Spirit of God working with his life. That's how we'll catch a glimpse of glory. That's how we will receive something in the Spirit that will energize us and give us a desire to press on to make heaven our home. Chapter 4, turn over there, 1 through 3. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee the things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one set on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like jasper and a sword and stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Let me tell you something to experience God, to be able to look into heaven. To see God on his throne. You say, Brother Pulliam, that don't happen to people like us. You get in the Spirit of God and it will. I say, You get in the Spirit of God and it will. You want to have an experience with God without the Spirit? <coughs> Good luck. But in the Spirit, God can reveal whatever He wants to reveal to you. He took Paul up into the third heaven, He was in the Spirit, wasn't He? Yes, he was. Listen, catch a glimpse of his splendor. Catch a glimpse of glory. Press and be persistent in your prayer life and until God can become real to you. Just professing God and, and talking about God. Oh, let God come alive. Experience God like you've never experienced him before. A glimpse of glory of God and his holiness, his awesomeness, it will instill in us a strive for heaven even until the end. Have we really got a, a strive in our life? Are we really pressing towards the mark? Are we just living from day to day? Let me tell you something. If we catch a glimpse of God's glory, it will bring alive a strive in our life to make heaven our home. Yes, it will. I want to speak to us about Stephen. Stephen was a man full of faith. And the Holy Ghost. And power. And the Bible says he done wonders and miracles. He had wisdom and the Spirit. He was appointed a deacon. And he was doing good. The Lord led him to preach. Turn over there with me in Acts chapter 7. But listen. 
Stephen had long since caught a glimpse of glory. He had something that had come alive in his life. He was full of faith in the Holy Ghost and the spirit and wisdom of God had consumed him. He was on fire for God and he was looking homeward every day. You believe that? Yes. He was looking homeward every day. God moved on him to preach a message. It was his first and last that he would ever preach. But he preached the word of God. He preached the gospel. He preached to these people who needed to hear the word of God. Look with me in Acts chapter 7 verse 54. Let me tell you, you catch a glimpse of glory in your life, it will carry you all the way to the end. I say it will carry you all the way to the end. When they heard these things that Stephen had been preaching, it says they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But listen, Stephen was already looking towards home. He already had his heart set on making heaven his home. Back a little prior to this, I believe it said when he come before the council, he was sitting there and they looked on him. He had the face of an angel. Hmm? Now listen, when Moses, <laughs> when Moses had his experience with God at Mount Sinai, and God moved his hand and allowed Moses to catch a glimpse of his back part as he passed by, the glory of God shone upon his face there was an effect on his life, Nick, that followed him the rest of his days on this earth. He had to wear a veil over his face because people could not stand to look upon him because of the reflection of the glory of God. Wouldn't you like to have that to happen to you? I would. <laughs> I'd gladly wear a veil. I'd cover up this old ugly mug. I'd gladly wear a veil the rest of my life. That's not how God works anymore. But I tell you this, when they looked on Stephen's face, the Bible says he had the face of an angel. Now this was before that they pounced on him and, and gnashed at him and stoned him. He was already, he had already caught a glimpse of glory and he was looking homeward. But it says, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Isn't that the sweetest ending to a life here on this earth you could ever imagine? Let me tell you something. He had caught a glimpse of glory and he had his face set on going home long before they cast the first stone. Hmm? He, that, that's, what, that's what was the final thing that drove them to what they'd done. He said, I see Jesus. <laughs> he looked up into the heavens and said, I see Jesus standing at the Father's right hand. That was the last thing. That was the last straw. They couldn't stand it no more. But before they ever bounced the first stone off of him, he had caught a glimpse of glory. Yeah. Let me tell you something. Don't wait till your last breath. Right. Don't wait till you're on the deathbed hoping that you'll see angels coming instead of demons. We better catch a glimpse of glory yeah. today. Yeah. We better... We better get our eyes set on home today, right? You may not have the opportunity that some people have. There's been many stories 
nurses and doctors have shared down through time of people on their deathbed pulling at the sheets and try, crawling backwards in the bed trying to get their feet out of the fire. I'd rather have my eyes set on glory, hadn't you? I'd rather be looking over into heaven saying, I see Jesus. God help us. Listen, we need to catch a glimpse of the glory of God through the Spirit of God. God help us. But listen, turn with me to 2 Corinthians 3. This is going to happen through the Spirit of God. On your knees, seeking God, praying, meditating on God day and night, that the Spirit would draw you from glory to glory. Right? Hmm? God don't talk to men through burning bushes. I hadn't heard nobody speak of it lately anyway. But I'll tell you one thing. When you get on your knees and you begin to get somewhere in the Spirit of God, the Bible tells us it will carry us from that glory to another glory and we'll become in His image. That's how the Spirit operates. That's the only way you're going to catch a glimpse of glory. Chapter 3. I'm going to read this whole chapter real quick. This is it. Do we begin... Uh, I, I read this. There was a few verses in here I wanted to share, and I couldn't. I kept backing up, backing up, backing up. But we need to hear this whole chapter. Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Now, Paul's getting some word. Let's listen to everything he's saying. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. Uh-oh. What are you saying here? The law was going to be done away with. You know what else? Moses was going to die one day. <laughs> the glory of God shone upon his face, but you know what? Moses was going to die. Hmm. Now what are we going to do? How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that it selleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ." But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord.
Let me tell you something. We're, we're not going to catch a, a glimpse of the glory of God no other way except by the Spirit of God. That, has, that is how God has designed it. For this day and hour, for you and I, the Spirit will lead us from glory to glory and it will reveal God in His fullness to you. How many wants to experience that? I do. The Lord really blessed me as I pondered on this. I, I've laid and thought about this message this week. I've dreamed about this message. I went to sleep with it on my mind. Dreamed about it. Woke up with it on my mind. What's God saying to this old boy? Catch a glimpse of his glory. If we can get that in our heart, that will give us the driving force. It will be an unfailing strength in your life, knowing heaven awaits. I appreciate you this morning. I appreciate your attendance.